Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1. There you go. Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to just give you a little introduction to the series that we're about to go into. Praise God. I went, I went, to, a, I went to a conference a few years back, and the conference was called Breaking New Ground. And when I got back, you know, you go to a conference, you're excited, you come back, and, you know, you don't have as much money as you did when you went there. <laughs> Amen. You, we, we drove out there. It was, it was a few states away, so we drove out there. And, you know, you're all excited with the men that are in there. But I went, when I got home, I said, Lord, seriously, I went there, and what does breaking new ground mean to me? You know, I'm ready, Lord. Bless me. You know, go, God, you're going to do something new in my life. And, you know, you're going to do something new on my job and, on, and new in the ministry and, and all those wonderful things. But the Holy Spirit began to redirect my thinking. Amen. He said, you're breaking new ground, but you're not going to break it in a new place. No, you're going to break it in the same place. Yeah, okay, in the same place. I'm like, okay, God, well, yeah, right there in the same job I got. You're going to do it. Amen. In the same place. And it began to compel me to read Nehemiah. And, you know, when, when the Lord began to compel me to read Nehemiah, in my heart I was like, all right, Lord, there's going to be a Sam Ballad and a Tobiah who's going to try to get involved, you know. But we rebuke him right now, Lord. We come against him with the blood of Jesus. And I started thinking, I said, no, read Nehemiah. And the Holy Spirit kept pressing me to read Nehemiah. So I began to read Nehemiah, and God began to open my understanding that I was going to break ground, but we weren't going to break ground, not only me, but his body, amen, that we were going to break ground in the same place where the destruction happened. Oh, the destruction happened. You're going to break ground in the same place, and you're going to repair what I have already ordained. And you're going to repair it for me. What, what, what are you talking about? So we went to Nehemiah. And when you read Nehemiah chapter 1. Read Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's start right there at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with, uh, with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant uh, that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. What were they? I'm going to ask you guys to talk back to me. Amen. A few times tonight. What were the people in, Judah, in, in, in Jerusalem, what, what kind of condition did they find themselves in? Great trouble and disgrace. And let's read why. It says, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Why was it? The walls have been what? And the gates have been burned with fire. And the Lord said, my people's time is to repent gates and I don't know, they repair the gates repair the gates well let me let me explain to you why they got to this point all right in 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 50 or excuse me 586 bc 586 bc the babylonians came as prophesied by jeremiah that god was going to send judgment against israel and they were going to be sent into exile into babylonian exile for 70 years there were three waves of Babylonian attack, and in 586 B.C., the third wave went in. Amen. The first wave, they took Daniel. Y'all remember Daniel? Amen. Daniel was taken over to Babylon. Well, 586 B.C., Babylonians actually penetrated the walls of Jerusalem, and they burnt down all the important, city, uh, all the important buildings, and they tore down, they burnt down the temple, and they broke down the walls, and they burnt down the gates. Amen. The problem with Israel was that they continued to go back into idolatry, into, into idolatry and into spiritual adultery. Amen. To spiritual adultery. Because we got to understand where Israel comes from. I'm going to just give you a really brief history, and a lot of you might already know this, but it helps because of where we're going to go in the Word. Amen. So what, what happened with Israel was they were little people, amen, they got brought out of Canaan, and they, Canaan, and they went, they, they went into, 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 into Egypt. Praise God. And over where they were originally from, they saw a lot of idol worship. And they worshipped the Baals in Canaan. Amen. They worshipped the Baal God. The Baal God was, was composed of several gods, of, of many gods. But, but the main God was El. Amen. The main God was who? 
El. And so, and so, and when Israel goes into, into Egypt, then they saw a lot of idol worship. They were polytheistic people and they were worshiping a lot of idols. Their main God was Amon Re. Amon Re was an invisible God. And so what they did with Amon Re was because they wanted an image of the invisible God. They represented him with a bull. Praise God. And so when Israel, all they see is this bull worship. And the way they worshiped this bull was that they brought treasures into the treasury as to find favor with this, with this uh, invisible God, with this, with this Amon Re, so that he would answer their prayers. Praise God. And then what they would do is that they would, they would perform magic in order to please this Amon Re. Well, this is why when the Israelites are brought out of Egypt and they're out there in the wilderness and Moses goes up to the mountain, when he gets back, they said, well, we just got the gold. And when we threw it in a pot, a calf head came up. I mean, just popped out. Praise God. And so, you know, I mean, he just popped up. And you would think that Moses would say, what a ridiculous story. All right. Amen. And so while Moses knew that that wasn't true, he never said it was a ridiculous story because all they saw in Egypt Amen. Was magic being performed? Praise God. So throwing something in a pot and something coming out of it was not foreign to them. And so they came and they said, you know what? Among God, the among God, the one that's represented by a bull, by a calf head, he's the one who's led us out to Egypt. Amen. All they knew was this calf head, was this bull. And so when they left into the wilderness, they wanted to bring the bull with them. Praise God. And so as they began to develop into a nation, at first, it is believed that Israelites, that the Jewish people were a, a, a polytheistic people from before, and then they became a henotheistic people, which meant that they believed that there were other gods, but they were faithful to one. Finally, by the time the kings come around, they finally realized, because God was trying to show them that I'm not the bull, and I am not the Baal. I am Yahweh. I am God all by myself. There is no other one. And by the time they get to the time of kings, they become, they finally realize there is no other God. Right. Amen. They finally understand that, that they, were, so they were meant to be a monotheistic people, which meant that they own, there was only one God and they only worshiped him. Right. Praise God. Well, the problem was that coming out of Egypt, Amen. They were, they were always ridiculed and looked upon as insignificant. They were never counted as among the nations. Man, they were Israel. They were the Israelites, the runaway slaves from Egypt. And so imagine, can you believe taking on the throne of a king in a, in a, in a nation that has been disregarded? Amen. A nation that has been overlooked and not counted among the United Nations. That king then began to succumb to the pressure of maybe we should have more idols. Maybe we should have more gods, or maybe we should serve the God that those other nations serve so that we would be counted among them, so that our image would be not runaway slaves from Egypt, but that we would be a nation. Yeah. Praise God. Uh, it's amazing what we do under pressure when we want to be, become significant. Praise God. And so under pressure, these kings continue to allow these people to worship the bells and to worship the bull. Amen. Jeroboam comes after, after, after Solomon dies and, and Rehoboam, his son, takes over. Jeroboam and him have a falling out. He goes into Egypt, and when he comes back, he brings the bull worship back to Israel. Amen. So that the people, when Judah and Israel split, so that the people wouldn't have to go to Israel to worship God every year, he set up a bull in Dan, and he set up another bull, I believe, in, in, in um, I'm not even going to tell you the, the city it was in, because I can't remember off the top of my mind. But he said, look, you can come and you can worship your God right here, a bull. Amen. Can you imagine these people coming out of Egypt, and the God that they begin to serve tells Moses, he doesn't even give him a name. He just says, I am that I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, when Moses is asking, well, you know, you know what, what should we say? He says, tell him I am that I am. And he brings them out into the wilderness and refuses to give them an image. Yeah. So now you're not only serving one God, you're serving an invisible God. There's not even an image to represent him. Right. That made matters even worse. And so they make this box. God gives them, God gives them the, 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 the instructions to make this box that they call the Ark of the Covenant. It only represented God. And it says that on top of this box was the mercy seat. And that was the throne of God. Amen? But guess what? It too was invisible. <laughs> so even when they carried the box and on top of it was the mercy seat, the throne of God, there was nothing there to represent him. 
So God is teaching them to live by faith out there in the wilderness. God shows them to try, is trying to teach them to live by faith once they had settled into Canaan. Look, I am not the bull, I am not the bell, and there is no image that can represent me. I am God all by myself. And so I brought you out of Egypt, and I expect you to serve me. I want you to fall in love with me. But God, we need to see something. And so here's where the hard part came in. Because after thousands and thousands and thousands of years of serving this invisible God and struggling to serve the invisible God, he finally gives them an image. Colossians tell us that Jesus Christ was the image of the invisible God. He finally gives them an image. And can you imagine that the invisible God, the omnipotent God, the omnipresent God, the, um, the all-knowing God would send a guy from Nazareth <laughs> that when the Pharisees looked at him, they mocked him. Do you mean to tell me that this is our invisible God? They would not accept. Look, we finally came to conclusion. Okay, God, we're going to accept that there is no image to hold you. We're going to accept that you're only one. And when God says, now swallow this, here is my image. They struggled with it because it wasn't what they expected. This is our God. And then he finally comes into Jerusalem on a little donkey. Amen. This is our God. So this was the struggle that Israel always had, the fight that they had within them of serving an invisible God after they came from seeing these nations that serve so many gods and, and, and they only serve in one God and he was invisible. There was no image to contain him. Amen. And so because they continued to go back into idol worship, when Zedekiah was the king, he allowed the people to go back into idol worship. Zedekiah now is the king where God, where God begins to send his judgment against Israel, and they get sent to Babylon for exile. After the 70 years, God uses Ezra, and that's where you get the book of Ezra from, to rebuild, to reconstruct the temple. And then he uses Nehemiah to go and repair the walls, amen, and repair the gates. Why? Was, you, do you think that God was so interested in the wall so that the people could defend themselves? You're talking about an invisible God who used to send frogs and who sent who hemorrhoids and who sent sounds and rain and thunder and hail against enemy. God didn't need a, a wall to protect his people. Amen. God, God didn't need a wall to keep enemies back. Sometimes God would confuse the enemy by sending sounds. They would just say, oh, my God. He made, a, he made the nation of Israel sound like a multitude of people, and the enemies got fearful. God didn't need a, uh, uh, God didn't need a wall. He didn't need any gates. It was more to it. God is a purposeful God. He's a meaningful God. When he told him to build a tabernacle, you guys know that it was through the tabernacle that he begins to disclose his plan of redemption. Amen? Well, guess what? It was through these walls and through these gates that he was making a declaration. He was making an announcement. Listen, Israel, you know the walls that you go in and out of, or rather the gates that you enter in and exit out of every single day? If you sit there and you look at it, I'm giving you an announcement. I'm giving you a declaration. I'm letting you into my blueprint, into my plans, into my secrets. Ephesians lets us in, amen? Well, when Paul is etching, when he's writing Ephesians, he's letting us into, into God's counsel. God had a counsel, almost like God sat there and consulted with himself and said, how am I going to repair this whole issue of man falling away from me? How am I going to reconcile them to myself? And so God has this plan and this master plan. He finally etches it out and he finally shows it to us through the walls and the gates of Israel. These were the gates and the walls that surrounded the temple. The temple was the place where humanity met with divinity. It was the place where God and man was the only place where he could meet with him after the fall. And these walls and these gates were declaring to us, this is how you keep the presence of God with you. This is how you keep the presence of God in your life. Amen? So then he sends them out, begin to repair them. And we're going to see what God teaches us as he begins to repair these walls. Because anytime there are no walls and there are no gates, the people of God will be in great disgrace and in great trouble. Amen? Because it is this that is necessary 
for the presence of God to be there. Amen. It is this. that They had to break through these gates first to get to the presence of God. Amen. So let us go see. It says there, the wall of Jerusalem, verse 3, is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for the days, for some days I had mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, then he goes into a prayer. Go over there to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11. I went to the Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone and what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any other who had been doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble you are in. Jerusalem lies in uh, ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. So he said, let us go. We got to reconstruct this so we are no longer in disgrace. Jerusalem had 12 gates. Somebody say 12 gates. 12 gates. But, the, but there were 10 gates that, that Nehemiah speaks of that were repaired. 10 gates. How many gates? 10 gates. And so now first gate, there was the sheep gate. There was the fish gate, the old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the east gate or rather the horse gate, the east gate, and the inspection gate. The first gate we're going to rebuild is the sheep gate. Amen? He's letting us in now into his blueprint of how he was going to reconcile man back to himself. You start at the sheep gate, and you end at the gate of inspection. Praise God. Let us go. Chapter 3, verse 1. Eliashib, the high priest... And his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred. Say the Tower of the Hundred. Which he dedicated as far as the Tower of Hananiel. Now, your version, if you're reading the King James Version, it'll say the Tower of Mia. Amen? Mia in Hebrew is hundred. Amen? So Tower of Mia and Tower of the Hundred is the same thing. Praise God. So the first gate that we had to repair in order to understand how God was going to rebuild or rather reconcile man back to himself had to be the sheep gate. Amen. To understand what the sheep gate is, though, the sheep gate was the gate in which the people of, of, of Israel brought their little lambs. Amen. Their little offerings, their little sacrifices to God. And they had to enter in through the sheep gate where the priests took over and then they would take the animal down to the temple and there sacrifice it before the Lord. So the first thing that they had to do was go through the sheep gate and then get to the temple. Amen. So you had to go through the sheep gate and get to the temple. Amen. Now, the problem, though, before you were too quick in bringing your offering, you had to go look at the Levitical law to see how you had to bring the offering. Amen. So let's go look at Leviticus real quick which most of you might already know, but let's go look at Leviticus chapter 1. We're going to journey through these scriptures, amen? And by the time the night is over, you'll see why we journey through this thing. Chapter 1, verse 3. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without what? without blemish, without defect. He must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. Let's go down to verse 10. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, he must offer a male without what? Without blemish. Now let's go over there to chapter 3, verse 1. 
If someone offering is a fellowship offering, and he offers animals from the herd, whether male or female, he is to present it before the Lord, an animal without? Amen. Amen. Without blemish. Chapter 4, verse 3. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, he must bring to the Lord a young bull without? Without blemish as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. So God was like, look, there's different kind of offerings, but the one thing that remains consistent is that whenever you dare bring a little animal through that sheep gate, he had to be without blemish. Well, something happened in Malachi. Let's go over to Malachi. Something happened over in Malachi. Let's start at verse 6. I know that Malachi, we normally speak about Malachi when we're talking about tithes and offerings. But there's a greater message that God wants to, that God was conveying when he had Malachi write this book. We're going to read what, what happens here in Malachi. You have it, say amen. amen. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his mother, or master rather. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Say, says the Lord Almighty, it is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible? When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? Somebody say blind animals. Blind. Yeah, blind animals. It says, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled animals. Somebody say crippled. crippled. Or diseased animals. So he, he's, he pinpoints two afflictions. He said they were blind and they were crippled. Amen? But check this out. It says here, it says, try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now implore God to be gracious to us. Say, be gracious. Be gracious. God was telling him, look, what you need is for God to be gracious with you. Because what you have done is so detestable to me that I should perhaps destroy all of you guys. In fact, shut the door of the temple down. I don't even want you to come into my presence anymore. You better ask God to be gracious to hold his wrath back from you. Somebody say, be gracious. be gracious. Be gracious when you're offering those blind and when you're offering those crippled animals. Amen. God, be gracious. Be gracious. Now, check this out. What I want you to understand is that the Old Testament, you know, was a foreshadow of the, of the New Testament. Amen. Of what was to come. So when they were offering lambs, when they were offering sacrifice, amen, these sacrifices were representing a human being, amen. We know that God wasn't talking about a real animal, for we know that the blood of bullocks and goats would not satisfy God, amen. But it was to point to us, to a person, Nehemiah, or rather Isaiah begins to reveal to us that this lamb that you guys are talking about is actually a man. Amen. This lamb is actually a man. In fact, in Genesis, when you see Abel being killed, you see a lamb and then you see a man. First, the lamb was sacrificed. Then the man was sacrificed. God was already showing us that this lamb is actually a man. Amen. Amen. This lamb was actually a man. And Isaiah shows us that this lamb was actually a man. Finally, John reveals to us, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Amen. So this lamb, these sacrifices were to represent the ultimate sacrifice was with Jesus Christ, a human being, which God uses him as an analogy, as a lamb. Amen? As a lamb. Well, those sacrifices that were being brought into the presence of God that had blemishes represented the sin of humanity. You cannot come before God with sin. Amen? So when he was talking about lame animals and crippled animals and blind animals and diseased animals, this represented humanity, amen, and all the sin of humanity that God just could not bear, spa share the same space with. Amen? Amen. Now, now let's go look at, at this thing because Jesus... Christ comes and when Jesus Christ comes he actually comes to validate and fulfill every single one of these gates now the one thing I want you to know about Eliashib the high priest who repaired the sheep gate that's why he was a high priest because it was the priest that dealt with the sheep gate so it had to be a high priest and his name was Eliashib 
Eliashib in the Hebrew means God will restore. Right. Say what? So prophecy has dual meaning, amen? There's rather dual fulfillment. There's a natural fulfillment, and then there's a spiritual fulfillment, amen? The natural fulfillment was Eliashib, the high priest, restoring the natural sheep gate, amen? amen? But what happened after Malachi? What happened after Malachi, between Malachi and Matthew? God shut down. God shut down because of the sin of Israel was so bad. I mean, they had, they, had, they had showed contempt for his name so bad that for 400 years, God shuts down. There's no rhema word, no prophetic word. There's no prophet. There's absolutely nothing. There is not an utterance from God's lip. Amen? Absolutely nothing for 400 years. Until when? Until Eliashib shows up. Amen? Until Jesus Christ shows up there to John chapter 5. Let's go over there to John chapter 5. What gate are we repairing? The sheep gate. We're repairing the sheep gate. The gate where you bring the sacrifices through to get to the temple. Amen? The sheep gate. We're going somewhere tonight. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem, near the what gate? Near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. This is the only time we hear about the sheep gate in the New Testament. And it was fitting that the sheep gate in Greek, let me give you the definition in Greek. The Greek word is probatikos, which is relating to sheep. A gate through which they led into Jerusalem. It is from the word probaton, which means something that walks forward. A quadruped, especially a sheep. And finally, the root word is probino, which means to walk forward, to advance. It was fitting that probino is the Greek word for sheep because the, the sheep were supposed to advance from the sheep gate to the temple, the sheep gate was a place of advancement. The sheep gate was a place of what? Advancement. You were supposed to walk forward. Amen. You were intended, if you got through the sheep gate, to advance to the temple. Amen. But the problem with the sheep gate here in John chapter 5, let's see what the problem was. It says that when he got there, there were a great number of disabled people that used to lie there. The blind... The lame, the paralyzed. At the place of advancement, the people were stuck. How can you be stuck at the place of advancement? Now, now here comes the high priest. You know, just to save you some time, you can go through the scriptures, but Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ was the high priest, and he was the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, amen? And so Jesus Christ, the true Eliashib, the revelation of Eliashib, the one who would restore God, reconcile God, humanity back to God, had shown up to the sheep gate because he said, I'm going to show you how I'm going to repair it. But first, let's address the people that are there. They were blind. They were lame and they were paralyzed. The last time we heard from God was back in Malachi, 400 years before that, where they were bringing sheep to God that were blind, that were lame. Oh, my God. And that were depressed. You know what I'm saying? It was the same affliction in Malachi that he runs into right there at the sheep gate, right. at the place of advancement. Because God told you one thing. Look, I'm giving you the remedy for this whole foolishness that you guys are doing here in Malachi. And the remedy is pray that God will be gracious to you. And so in order to begin to display the remedy, they get there to the house of kindness, the house of grace called Bethesda. Amen. Right there by the sheep gate at the place of advancement, humanity was stuck. Now, you guys know the story when you continue to read. It says there, here in the verse 5, one who was there, or rather, if you read in the King James Version, it says, and they waited for the moving of the water. Yeah. 
From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down. Who would stir the water? The angel of the Lord, right? Will stir the water. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. So there they were, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. They're at the place of advancement, stuck with infirmities that would prevent a man to advance forward. Amen? If you're paralyzed, you can't advance. If you're lame, you have struggling, you struggle advancing. And if you're blind, it's hard for you to advance forward. So there they were waiting for the angel to come and stir the water. Jesus picks the guy that had been there for how long? Now, I like you guys. You know your word. I might just relax a little bit on going through all these scriptures. He picked the guy that had been there for 38 years waiting for the angel to stir the water again. And perhaps this time I get my shot at it to jump in, and when Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? In fact, you've got a note, and we're going to see why. This was the only guy, the only person in all Scripture, in the New Covenant, where Jesus asked him, how do you feel about 